Hello. Well, I think it's high time I did some more blacksmithing on my blacksmithing channel. Uh, a chap called Dan has written in and asked me to make him a cleaver. I've never made a cleaver before, but I reckon I can do it. So I don't actually have a cleaver I can use as a pattern for this, and every time I go out into the wide world, um, I forget to go look for cleavers in the shops for inspiration. Um, finally, I thought I'll just get on with it. I'm going to base it somewhat on this. This is the kitchen knife that was my, I think, the first knife that I ever made. Um, the shape is quite good, I think. And I think it will suit being turned into a cleaver. I'll draw it out and show you what I mean. What I like about this kitchen knife then is it, it has a nice blocky handle. It's quite square in section. And I find it's, it's very grippable for a big knife. So you can grip it like that and my thumb sits in there. And it just so happened to just work out. It's kind of designed, kind of a happy accident. And I think this kind of grip, kind of shape is adaptable into a cleaver format. If you imagine then that the handle is very similar, but the metal here and the spine is much thicker, at least twice as thick as it is here. Um, I think if you look at that, the spine of it curves down and I think for a cleaver we either want it straight or probably slightly upwards and then the blade I've got there six inches yeah, so I think the blade's slightly shorter than this one and it's going to come down and I'll have something like that Something like that. <laughs> it's not much of a plan, but I think it will do. So like I say, about twice that, it's so about 4mm um, on the back of the spine. No taper, this tapers down towards the tip, in the distal taper that way. Uh, don't reckon we'll do that. So it'll be fairly hefty, and then I'll bevel it from about there. And I'll see, it'll either be a, f a flat now, I reckon a slight curve there. Yeah, there's never such a slight curve on the bottom. Right, we'll see what it turns out like. And I reckon a bit of a kick up there, holding it there, hang it up, and the handle just the same as that. That's my plan, let's do it. I should probably point out that um, there's actually two types of cleaver. There's the, what I would think of as a cleaver, which is for cleaving bones and things, and that's a big chopping instrument. There's also the so-called Chinese cleaver, which is used much more as an all-purpose kitchen knife. So it's, it's made of material that's about as thin as this, um, but it looks like a cleaver when you look at it side on. And it's, but it's quite thin, and the reason it's cleaver shaped is so you can chop a load of vegetables, scoop them up, and stick them in your pan. The type of cleaver that I'm making would be much more of the chopping meat type cleaver. I hope that's clear. Right, let's go find some metal. I'm going to use some of this as my starting stock. These are the leaf springs from an old Duff lorry, and yeah, which I salvaged off a couple of weeks ago. They're much, much thicker here than I really want them. You know, over twice as thick, I reckon. So it's going to take a lot to shift it down to the right size. But it's the right type of steel. This is also likely to be the right sort of steel. This is a leaf spring off a very old Landover. Um, but it's not quite thick enough. Yeah. Not quite thick enough for what I want. Well, that is to say, it probably is thick enough, but by the time it's drawn down to be long enough that way, and, you know, I don't think it's hefty enough stuff. So we'll go with this. This is probably 5160 steel. Um, that's 51 means low chromium, so some chromium content, but not much. Um, and the 60 is the amount of, well, it's 0.6 of a percent of carbon. 
so a medium carbon steel. What you end up then is something that won't hold an ultimate edge like um, a shaving razor or indeed that kitchen knife that I just showed you. That's The kitchen knife is um, 1075 or something like that, so a, a bit more carbon, meaning that it'll take a, a, um, a sharper edge, but it's not as overall as strong. It's always a compromise between hardness and give in the, in the metal. Obviously a spring, uh, like it's these truck springs, it's got to have lots of bounce to it. Um, so yeah, for, I think for a cleaver or an axe or something like that, this will be ideal. Um, I do intend to make some axes actually, that's why I salvaged this stuff. This here, lift this up, this is one of the back springs. You see here how thick the section is here. I'm going to have a go at making some axes by driving a hole through here. But that's for another day. For now then, use one of these slightly slimmer front springs and take a chunk off the end here. In its current state, this spring will have been hardened and tempered. So I'm not going to try and saw it in the bandsaw, I'm just going to lop a bit off the end with the angle grinder. So that of course is much more material than I'm going to need, but uh, <laughs> I've got plenty of it. Um, yeah, better safe than sorry. I've been doing a lot of forging recently using the gas forge, it's very convenient. Um, but this job, with this stuff, I'm going to, because it's so thick, and it's harder, much harder than mild steel, I'm going to have to get this up to a much higher temperature to work it effectively. So instead of the gas forge, I'll be using a solid fuel forge, which you should be able to see just about there. Today's accelerant, it's just a bit of a very old white spirit. Not too violent in the start. <laughs> A bit soggy. While that comes up to heat, I'm going to sort out a power hammer. That's what we're going to need to mash that really thick section stuff down to something more usable. By adjusting this part here, which is an old tractor top link, if I turn it, it pulls in both ends. And by doing that, I can shorten the stroke of the hammer. You see that's floating there now. I'm going to wipe it out. If I go there just off of this bottom anvil, that's now the bottom of the stroke. Except it's not of course because this is a spring, so there will be two. But yeah. That's how you can set it up for different sections of metal. And then I can lock it off with this bit here. Nearly 
there. Where I'm going to fire up the generator and get the power hammer working. of it as it's being used up and moving on to this which is just plain old house coal. House coal actually works better for my forge than the um, very good proper stuff. that bevelin you'll see the metal curves more and it's curving because the metal down this side is moving more than the metal this side So what I'm doing is squashing it here on the main part of the anvil and then by hammering it here on the on the horn here I'm pushing it outwards so I'm fullering it out increasing the length.
here's where we are so far then. This is the plan I start off with, and this is the progress at the moment. This here then is what I'm going to chop out next. Remember, I'm going for something form factor similar to the kitchen knife here. It's a similar kind of handle. Um, yeah, I'll probably take a little bit off there. It's about the right thickness all the way down. So I'm going to cut out these bits that I've marked. Then I'm going to put it in the gas forge this time and just go over it all, flatten it off, just make it nice. Um, no big dramatic forgings required from now on. Just in case of tidying it up, getting the final shape down and getting this all nice and continuous from the blade into the tang so I can fit wooden scales on it just like on this one. point of all this forging you should be able to see when it comes straight onto the view it's a very definite taper going from the thick spine down to the edge the rest of the shaping I'll do on the grinder but uh, yeah it's most of the work done so I put it back in the forge and I'm bringing it up to critical temperature, so a nice bright red, orangey sort of temperature. And then I'll let it cool down slowly. So this will be the normalising, well again, another normalising procedure. And I want to do this three times to take all those stresses out. If I leave the stresses in the steel, when I go to quench it, it's liable to warp. It's a lot less liable to warp than, say, a knife, because obviously it's much thicker material. But, nonetheless, I don't want any warping at all. So, yeah, three normalisation cycles it is. While that cools down in the forge, I thought it'd be a good chance to do the handle scales. On this kitchen knife, I used uh, some, it's some tropical hardwood. I think it's probably a roco or something like that. This is the piece of wood that I cut it out from. And it's actually a piece of old, uh, from a school science lab, this uh, laptop. And you can see here, this must have gone round the sink. These are the holes for the taps to come out of. Anyway, it's really good wood for handles because it's nice and nice and tough stuff. Also makes good tabletops. So this is two matching pieces. You can see there the grain actually travels all the way through. It's quite quite nice if you can remember to do that. <laughs> so I'm going to do the same on this. Right, I'm going to go over to the saw and cut a section out of it, and we'll see what's what. I'm about to use the chop saw for ripping wood, which is definitely not advised. But on the other hand, it does give a nice straight cut. 
So if I fed this wood through the bandsaw, I, yeah, I'd have to straighten it up afterwards. This is much harder to hold like this because this is obviously a chop saw, it's for cutting wood like that. But nonetheless, because this one has a slide on it, it'll do it. I've just got to be very careful to hold this in the right position. Right, so that's just taken off that scrap bit off the edge. Now I get the knife handle. Good. So there's our two scales. Just got to cut it this way now. Hopefully that's clear then, the reason that I cut the long bits of this on the chop saw is because now I've got a relatively smooth surface to start off with so it's going to take a minimal amount of preparation to make that flat because these surfaces, because these surfaces here are going to sandwich that piece of metal which will also be flat when I've finished with it. After a few minutes on the sander, just to take these edges, sort of clean them up and get the lines that I want, it's looking much more cleaverish. I think that's undeniably a cleaver shape now. Here's the drawing then, getting a bit indistinct now. There's the kitchen knife. So yeah, not too far away. I quite like this sweep of it here. Um, so I punch there where the hole's going to go. be something like that and I've made it so that there's a slightly different curve here to here I think there is an argument for making this flat but I quite like it as it is yeah I think that's a nice shape to it and I've got plenty of taper coming down here and you should be able to see there how much taper there is there The feel is just right, I think. There's plenty of forward weight. So, unlike a knife where you taper it down to the point here, this is the, the same, well, as, as close as I could get it to being the same all down here. And it's got a proper front heavy heft to it, as a cleaver should have. The handle is a bit longer than on the kitchen knife. A little bit extra there because it occurred to me on this one I want to make more of a, a well in here so that there's less chance of your hand slipping off and your hand needs to grip round fully on the kitchen knife I tend to hold it forward choke up on it a little bit like that but I think for holding the cleaver you want your hand wrapped around the whole handle, so yeah, a little bit longer handle I think. But we'll see, I'll keep checking as I go along. Right, I'm going to tidy up this corner. And I might put a bit more shape into the handle, but yeah, we're definitely getting there. The steel's been through two normalising cycles so far, so it's as soft as it's going to get now. So I should be able to work on it even with hand tools like this.
Yeah, that's right. Right, I'm going to countersink the hole a little bit. Yeah, that's big enough. So the hole is 8mm, I'm going to countersink it with a 14 just a little bit. Yeah, I'll grind that bit out now as well. I think I will just grind a bit of the bevel here, just a tiny bit. While the metal's soft, it's easier going on the on the sander. Right, back in the forge for its last normalisation and if it stays straight along the spine after that, which it should do, um, heat treat. just get the whole thing to the same temperature and then and then only briefly but uh, yeah I think I've got it so one of the reasons for being so careful about the thermocycling with uh, this piece of metal is bear in mind it used to be a truck spring it spent a long time in a curved shape and part of what I'm trying to do here is to make it forget that it ever used to be a spring and get it used to the fact that it's now a straight piece of metal when I heat treat this, unlike um, when I do a normal knife, um, I'm only going to harden the edge because on a chopping implement you don't want the entire thing to be hard like you would with a knife blade. Um, the, it's much better if the top surface is somewhat softer, it's got a bit more give to it. Anyway, leave that for a few hours. Right, it's cooled down again and it stayed lovely and straight which I'm taking as a very good sign next then I'm going to drill out for the handle scales I'm going to use this 5mm stainless steel which is what I used on the kitchen knife and it came out quite nicely okey Time for heat treat then. So the temperature I'm aiming at is a bit hotter than when the steel loses its magnetism and the magnet doesn't stick anymore. And then I need to go a little bit beyond that and then quench it in the oil which is over here. So that's just a can of olive oil. Uh, why olive oil? Well, because I, at one point I had loads and loads of olive oil. So there's some there. It's as uh, simple as that really.
garden. There we go. That noise there, um, see a bit of mild still. So the table is mild still, and you can hear that. Here. Cool. Right, before this goes right down to ambient temperature, I'm going to go and get it in the kitchen oven. Uh, before I do that, I'm just going to wipe off the excess oil that's on it. A couple of days later, and here we are. Didn't need to be a couple of days, <laughs> just had other things to do. So it's now been tempered twice, so that's two tempering cycles of an hour each in the kitchen oven at what was for me gas mark 8, which I was aiming for 240 um, degrees Celsius, which I think is about 460 Fahrenheit, something like that. That tempering process then is absolutely crucial for a, for a knife, and it's now made it into something that's properly durable. So it's just taking the edge off that extreme hardness from when it was quenched. And now this can be sharpened and it will be an actual tool. But first I'm going to put the handle scales on. So I've marked them with a couple of X's and a line for alignment so that I know that they came out of the plank like that and so they'll sandwich the handle like that. And that means that the grain will match nicely. I've clamped the cleaver up with the scale on there and now I'm just going to use my cordless drill to start these holes. There's the holes. I used a pillar drill to go through because that will mean that they'll be nice and square. It'll be perpendicular to this edge here as it goes through on the pillar drill. And then I'll use this one as a pan to do this one. Slightly better way would be to put a pin, drill one, stick a pin in it, and then that'll hold that position when you do the other two. But I was quite confident of my ability to clamp it just with my fists. <laughs> so that's what I did. Cool. Now I need some pins. Probably I'm going to make the pins a bit over length, I think. Yeah, I'm going to go with about 42mm pins. So I need three of those. So I'm going to cut them on the bandsaw and then I'm just going to stick them in the belt sander and just take the edges off. Because the pins are over long, um, that bit won't actually be part of the handle when it's finished, but it makes it much easier to get the pins in. So that's all I've done, probably doesn't even show up, but I've just chamfered the end just slightly, um, as, as like a bolt would look. Now, can I have a test fit? Good. That's all going to work. And it's nice to know that before you cover everything in epoxy. I find epoxy, as with many two-pack things, is very much temperature dependent on how quickly it goes off. So it's quite a cool day today. And I think the five minute epoxy will take at least half an hour.
marks again. See there, there's plenty of pin poking out. Now it's just a case of squeezing these bits together. And then I'll use these to pull in what will become the bottom of the scales. So I can see underneath there's plenty of epoxy oozing out all around there. So I've done a perfectly good job of getting that in there. A couple of hours later then, I did find another clamp to put on there just to get that very end bit of the handle. Get out of the way. Yeah, we've had a couple of hours and I can still make marks in the epoxy with my fingernail, so it's not still not rock solid. I think it'll be fine to carry on. So I'm gonna do most of the work on the belt sander. Now this wood, being a tropical hardwood, is quite unpleasant to breathe in the, the dust from it. Um, well, it's probably not best practice to breathe in any wood dust, really, if it can be avoided. So, anyway, I'm going to wear a proper mask. Right, so it's brought to a point, finally. <laughs> so it's only an 80 grit point, so it's not, it's not sharp yet. Although, obviously the geometry of it would mean that I could cut, I could chop wood with it quite happily. Whew, that took some doing. There's a lot of metal on that blade. Crikey, yes it did. This is a, um, well it's intended for woodworking, so it's a bit slow for metal work and uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not, not what I'd buy to do metal work, but it does the job, we're getting there. I was just going to point out there's a tiny bit of slack belt here just behind the wheel and that's what I used to get the final edge that's what I used to do nearly all the grinding on the knives um, obviously this is a massive blade compared to those so with this one for that final edge I'm pushing it in there you see where it deflects in a little bit so instead of pushing against the platen which is what I'm doing when I'm working on the main part of the bevel to actually get it sharp I'm pushing in that little bit there and that puts that final curve on it. Back in woodworking corner then. It's nice to have a break from that, uh, that sander. So I'm just hand sanding the handle and finishing off the contouring. Get it all 
nice. So I'm back to using an 80 grit. I've done the, the top of the handle and I've done the actual blade in up to 120 so far. So you should be able to see there the all the edges have been knocked off and it's now quite comfortable but very grippy and just that bit of shape in there just like with the kitchen knife means it gives you a good solid grip that's taken it to 320 that's as far as I'm going to go with that. Did manage to cut myself. <laughs> there you go. Right, now I'm going to stick it in some boiled linseed oil and uh, I'll soak it in this overnight. So, boiled linseed oil is somewhat different to raw linseed oil. Boiled linseed oil is what I use for tool handles, and raw linseed oil is what I use for things like the spoons here. Difference being that raw linseed oil is um, obviously a food product. If it's not actually going to go in your mouth, um, boiled linseed oil is generally better because it dries much quicker. It's not actually boiled anymore, it just has dryers in it which makes it act as if it was boiled, if that makes sense. This will just help stop any rusting for the time being and it will keep that nice black oxide forged finish look. But mainly what I'm after is to soak some into the handle there. Right, and I'll leave that until tomorrow. So yeah, I'm really happy with the way that's turned out actually. I think in the end, not having an example to copy or a picture to take a plan from, I've managed to produce an archetypal cleaver <laughs> in effect. So I think a cleaver is one of those things that everybody knows what a cleaver is supposed to look like. Just like everybody knows what an anvil is supposed to look like or an old fashioned telephone. Despite the fact that most people haven't seen either of those things, you know, or not very often at least. And I think this is, yeah, if you ask somebody to draw a cleaver and they'd come up with something along these lines. And it feels purposeful. Yes, it does. Yeah, pleased with that. I'm, to be honest, I'm somewhat reluctant to sell it now. I, um, yeah, well, I don't really have much use for a cleaver. I'm sorely tempted to keep it. <laughs> Not much of a businessman, really. So you might be able to see the scratches that are on it from the 120 grip. I'm going to go back to the sander and take those off. So I'm going to go up to, um, what is it, 240, 340, 400. That's taken it up to um, 400 grit. I normally go up to 600, but I felt that 400 gave a slightly brushed finish, which is just about perfect, I think, for what we're after here. I'm just going to put the final edge on and I use these ceramic rods which is what I use on all my knives. They're set up at the moment for 20 degrees final bevel. I'm going to put them at 25 which is the other setting here. So to use these sharpening rods all you do is, or with a knife for instance like this little carving knife, I start with it there and as I go down I then come off the tip. So all you've got to concentrate on is getting the keeping the blade vertical and then you end up with a perfect micro bevel so both this and this are ground right down to the edge but then just to make sure that that final edge is completely consistent I like to put on the micro bevel using these stones or rods rather so we start here Do that. 
And if it's already sharp, it'll only need a few goes. So I'd normally do it on the 20 degree um, setting there, but because obviously this is a brutal chopping instrument, 25 it is. Now this is a cleaver, it doesn't even have to be anywhere near as sharp as it is here. But, you know, I figure why not. I reckon that's sharp enough. <laughs> See if it shaves. Oh crikey, yeah. Well, there it is. So that's from a, a truck spring to a cleaver in um, several easy steps. Yes, like I say, I'm very reluctant to sell it now. Um, I've certainly undercharged for it. I think I quoted £70 to make a cleaver. Um, yeah, it should have been at least double that. So if there's anybody out there that wants to commission me to make some more, that's how much they'd be. But is a cleaver worth 140 quid? I'm not so sure. If you think it is, <laughs> you can commission me to make another one if you really want. Um, my next project though, I'm going to make something out of these. I have a bunch of these. These are um, farrier's rasps. And I'm going to make something that will also be a chopper, but should be considerably more affordable than the uh, rather posh cleaver that I've just come up with. So yeah, stay tuned for that. But for now, that'll do us I think. Thanks for watching. Cheers. Pumpkin soup for dinner.